Well, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke today, so if you guys would like to turn to Luke's Gospel, my favorite, we're going to be looking at chapter 14. Uh, as you're turning there, let's pray. Father, Lord, we come to you as we open your word, and we pray, God, that you would guide us in all truth. Pray, Lord, that you would not allow me to speak falsehood. I pray that only the truth would go out from this pulpit. I pray that if necessary, you might protect your people even from me. God, we desire truth. We desire uh, your truth, the only truth. We desire uh, to conform our lives around that truth, God, because we understand that you are a good and merciful God that has a design that is best for us. And the, the greatest thing that we can do is walk in this design. And so we, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us. May we have a hunger and a thirst to know more about you, uh, that we may fall deeper in love with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, Jesus, oftentimes when he would speak about the kingdom of God, he would compare it to a great banquet. And, and he did this uh, multiple times throughout the gospel. And it's not something new that he's doing here. Uh, this is something that people would anticipate and think about as they thought about the return of the Messiah, that there would be this, this messianic banquet that they would enjoy. It takes us all the way back to uh, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah prophesied about this day of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6. The prophet Isaiah says this. On this mountain, on Mount Zion, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well refined. The imagery here again is this, this great banquet at the end of time, at the day of the Lord, that those who know him, that's right, will be dining. They, they will be with the Lord. It's something that they, they anticipate. And so God would, through Christ, liken the, the kingdom of God to a great banquet. We see it in Isaiah. We see it as we fast forward all the way to Revelation, as we have the return of the Messiah, the return of the spotless lamb. Revelation 19.9 simply says, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb where the bride of Christ, his people, his church, will be united with their God, King Jesus, the spotless lamb. Yes. And so this imagery of this great banquet, whether you take it literally or figuratively, really doesn't matter. It, it's promised that this day will come, that we will be with the Lord in his presence. And this idea of reclining at his table is something that you and I need to consider. Is this a promise for us? See, God desires that all of us would be with him for all eternity. This is his desire for us. He has extended an invitation to everyone to come and to partake in this eternal messianic banquet with him forever and ever. The invitation has been extended to you. And so now what will you do with that invitation? Some will receive the invitation. Some will embrace it. They'll cling to it. They'll love it. They'll love God because he even invites them to partake, to have a seat at the table. And some will worship him and praise him and, and they will be at this banquet. And some will take the invitation and they will dismiss it. They'll discredit it. They'll reject it. And scripture is clear that for those who reject this invitation, that they will spend eternity in a real physical place that the Bible calls hell, where Jesus himself describes it, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But this is God, not God's desire for you. The invitation, again, is for you. And so the question we have to ask is, what will you do with this invitation? 
You personally, not what did your parents do with it, not did somebody else that you loved and care about, what did they do with it? What will you specifically, individually do with God's invitation to you to spend eternity with him? I think this is the question that Jesus wants us to ponder. He, he wants us to think about as we look at Luke chapter 14, as we look at the parable of the great banquet, this event that will happen, that Jesus is foretelling. And so we're going to look at Luke today. We're going to look at the parable of the great banquet, and, and we need to be asking the question, will we be there? Will we be with him? So again, Luke chapter 14, and we'll start in verse 12. But the setting here is pretty remarkable. Jesus has been going through. He's been healing people in the land. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He spent an awful lot of time tearing down the religious hypocrisy that is in the Pharisees. He spent a lot of time doing that, okay? poking holes in these Pharisees who are held in high esteem by the community. And Jesus is saying, man, they know a lot about God, but they do not know God. They don't know him. They're like whitewashed tombs. They look nice and clean on the outside, but on the inside, they're full of dead man's bones. And so Jesus is saying provocative things like this. And so the Pharisees don't really like Jesus. In fact, they hate Jesus and they're looking for ways in which they can trap him in, in something that he says so that they can get rid of him. And so what's interesting about this is in the setting of Luke 14, Jesus is reclined at the table of a leader of the Pharisees. He's having a meal with them, maybe a little banquet with them. And he's already been talking. He's already done a miracle in their presence. And this is on the Sabbath. And he does this miracle to see if, if it is a violation of the law to heal on the Sabbath and reminds even these religious leaders that if an animal of theirs uh, fell into a pit or was in need of care, that which one of them would not tend to their animal simply because it was on the Sabbath. And so Jesus heals on the Sabbath. And then he gives them a parable uh, that has to do with a banquet and a feast as well. And he's, he's telling uh, these religious leaders that if they will exalt themselves, they will be humbled. But if they will humble themselves, they will be exalted. Telling them that if you come to a feast, what you shouldn't do is go and place yourself at the position of honor, which be as close to the host as you could get. Because the host might come and he might move you down the line a little bit. And that would be disgraceful. And so he says, rather than doing that, sit at the place that is the most meek, furthest from the host, so that if the host chooses to, he can grab you and he can bring you closer to himself, and then you will receive honor. Right? And so it's about your position. Do you exalt yourself if you do? Pharisees and other religious people, maybe even some in this congregation, if you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. But if you will humble yourself before the Lord, then Jesus says you will be exalted. And then he continues on in his teaching. And this is where we take up in verse 12. Luke chapter 14, starting with verse 12. Jesus says this. He said also to the man who had invited him. This is a leader of the Pharisees. When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives, or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, kind of like the one they're enjoying at that moment, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So Jesus makes a shift here. He makes a shift from the temporal to the eternal. That these people are looking at the temporal things and they're dining with those who, who can repay them, people of other status, right? Uh, these people that are sitting around Jesus' table are Pharisees and lawyers, those of high position of prominence. And so you know that this has got to sting because it starts to reveal the condition of their hearts. It starts to reveal the sin nature that is inside of these religious leaders. I mean, they're doing exactly what Jesus says you shouldn't do here. 
when you have a dinner, don't, don't do it with all these people. Rather, invite the lame and the blind, right? These, these people were on the other side of, of the spectrum. These people were looked at as uh, being unclean, being cursed by God. And Jesus says, if you want to be blessed in eternity, you should have these people. Because you know why? They can't repay you. There's no other motivation for you to have them over and dine at your table other than you're just trying to love on them. You're trying to do what is pleasing to God because you're not going to gain anything from them. They're not people of influence. You're not getting connected. You're, you're not going to make better business transactions, right? You're, you're not going to be in networking. You're going to be doing it with people that can give you nothing in return. And Jesus says, that's how you'll be blessed. That's how you'll be blessed. Well, I think Jesus would have ended it there. We would have gone down to verse 25 where he goes back out into the crowds and is teaching. But we have verse 15. Verse 15 where somebody who is reclining at the table, I, I think they take issue with what Jesus is saying. And they should. Because the things that Jesus is saying, that has got a sting for these religious leaders, for these lawyers. It's, it can't feel good. And so verse 15, listen to what is said. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, to Jesus, but blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Jesus, what you're saying really, it doesn't matter because we're blessed. Why are we blessed? Because we're going to be dining at the great banquet of God. Of course we're going to be there. Not only are we Jews, but we are Jews of status. We are Jews that are held up in high esteem. We are the religious leaders of our day. Jesus, you're saying this thing, but it doesn't really matter. It's irrelevant. We'll all be blessed because we will all be dining at the table of God. And this is the approach that a lot of people have. I mean... I'm a pretty good person. It's no big deal. Uh, if there is a heaven or a hell, I'm sure I'll be with God. If there is a great banquet, I'm sure that I'll be with him. And Jesus turns this on his head. This is the whole reason why he goes into this parable is because he is going to push back on this idea that these people simply by their position would inherit eternal life with the creator and sustainer of all things. And so we get into the parable here. Uh, let's continue on. Verse 16, Jesus addresses uh, this man's critique. He says in verse 16, But he, Jesus said to him, A man once gave a great banquet, and he invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come. Come. For everything is now ready, but they all alike begin to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to the master the master's response. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and to the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Do you see the connection that Jesus is making? Yes. And the servant said, sir, what you commanded has already been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges, out to the farthest reaches of the city and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Man, that had to sting. These men reclining with Jesus, they know exactly who they are in this story. And this man is saying, Jesus, of course we're all blessed. We're all going to be at the great banquet of God. We'll be there. We're Jews. 
They know that this first invitation that went out went to the Jews. The Jews were the people of God set aside by Yahweh. He made them holy and distinct, separate unto himself. And this is the invitation that Jesus is addressing here. And those very same people at the end of the verses, Jesus says that the master of the house will say, I tell you, those people will not taste of my banquet. Well, we know that they would have been offended by hearing Jesus say this because they know the scriptures. Again, they know who they are. They know what Moses wrote in Exodus about the people of God. Exodus 19.5, God tells Moses to tell the people, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be my own possession among all of the peoples. All of the peoples God was setting aside a nation unto himself. Deuteronomy 14.2, Moses also says, For you are a holy people to the Lord. You are set apart specifically unto God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And Paul later reminds us of this This consistency of the the Jews receiving the invitation first and then it going out to the Gentiles. Romans 1, 6, he says he's not ashamed of the gospel. This is the good news of Christ. This is indeed the invitation. The invitation is indeed the good news of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I'm not I'm not ashamed of this invitation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And so, again, they would have known where they fit in this illustration. They would have known where they fit in this parable. And I think it had become what Jesus is addressing is the fact that it was their very position as Jews and these specific people as religious leaders of the Jews that had become a stumbling block to them. That many of them were looking at their position. I, of course I'm, I'm going to enjoy the covenant promises of Abraham. I am a physical bloodline descendant of Abraham. Of course I'm going to enjoy this, this, the, everything that comes from having covenant relationship, that I am going to be an heir to the covenant of Abraham, again, because of my position as a Jew. And this was their thinking, and it, and it became a stumbling block to them. And it is the same today, because very few people care about relationship with the Lord. And these were arguably the most religious people who have ever lived and the indictment towards them is the same throughout the scriptures. You look at the prophets and the indictment is that, yes, you you have the Torah, you have the law. You're even memorizing the law. You're you're even doing the works that God has called you to do. You're doing the sacrificial system. You're you're, you're doing the feasts and you're you're doing all of the, the things that look good from the outside. And yet God would tell them they do not know him. They don't know him. They know something about him, but they do not know him. They do not have intimacy with God. God desires to have intimacy. That blows my mind. Why would he desire intimacy with us? And yet he does. That's what he desires. And so we fast forward to today and the problem is still the same, especially within religion. And people look at their position. They say, well, I go to church on Sundays. I I, I come on Wednesdays and I help out with different things. I'm there on Thursdays. I, 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 I go down to the homeless shelter. I help feed people. I do all of these different things. And yet they do not know God. They may know something about God. They may know something about this Jesus. They may know something about a cross, but they do not know him. And they've not placed their faith and their trust in him. They've placed their faith and their trust in themselves, in their works, and in their position. Now, this is what Paul was pushing uh, back against in the letter to the Galatians the entire time. Mm -hmm. And so we see that nothing has changed, that the heart of man is, is still the same. And so Jesus is addressing this, that they should truly take checks and balances of themselves. 
My question to you is, do you know him? Do you just know something about him or do you have a relationship with God? And if you're not certain if you have a relationship with God, that probably answers the question. Because you should have intimacy with him. You should have a longing to grow deeper in your maturity and your understanding and in your love and in your devotion and your commitment to him because you recognize and understand who he is and all that he has done for us. See, Jesus, he also posed this, this question for people to consider. Just look back at Luke chapter 13. And this is hard. This is hard stuff for us, but we need to address it. 13, starting with verse 22. He, Jesus, went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? That's a great question. Will those who are saved be few? And Jesus says to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Now we go back to kind of this banquet setting here. He says, when once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, it's as if the master has invited everyone and he's waiting for those who will come to come. But there comes a time where it's too late. The door will be closed. You're not going to have the option of coming and entering into this great feast. So he gets up and he shuts the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, what do they call him? They call him Lord. Open to us. But then he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, but we ate and we drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. <laughs> this is exactly what the Pharisees could say to him. Jesus, we saw you. We saw you perform miracles. We, we heard about you. We, we even ate and drank in your presence, Jesus. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. And in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself cast out. And people will come from east and west and north and south. This is everywhere. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue. They will come and they will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And people are saying, but Jesus, I, I just assumed that I was in. I called you Lord. I, I, I ate in your presence. I saw you do miraculous works. So what is missing? Again, they know about him. They even call him Lord, and yet they don't know him. And on that day, it'll be too late. The door will be closed. And they will see those who are dining with the king and they will spend eternity in this place that Jesus says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's so serious that Jesus taught about this all the time. That we would take it seriously. That we would ponder it deep within our own hearts. Within our own souls. And we would ask the question, where will we be? Will we be dining with the king or will we be ones that are knocking on the door when it's too late? See, I think the problem for many people is their pride. There's a lack of humility because before you come to Christ, you have to recognize that you have a necessity for Christ. If you think that you've got it all figured out or that you're a good person and we start to compare ourselves with other people around us and we start to think, man, you know what? Uh, Jesus would be lucky to have me at the banquet. <laughs> Man, this is a lot of people. Man, they won't say this out loud, but I promise you, this is the, the posturing of a lot of people, specifically a lot of religious people. That, of course, I'll dine with Jesus. This, this is what the man is saying. 
of course we'll bless. We'll be there. And Jesus says, I want you to reconsider that. Think about the Pharisees, man. These people were held up on a pedestal. They're supposed to be the shepherds. They're supposed to be overseeing the people of God. They're supposed to be leading the people of God closer to Him, and yet they're doing the exact opposite. But they're still held up in a place of honor. And so I'm sure that these people started to think, man, again, I'm blessing you if I come to your banquet. (laughs) And we start to look at God in that very same light. And I think it's because the invitation is less important the more important we think we are. We got a high, lofty view of self and a small view of God. This banquet's not really going to mean much to us. Until again, you are standing at the door knocking and it's too late and then it will mean everything to you. Then you'll realize what has occurred. You'll realize the mistake that you have made by rejecting the invitation. So we need humility. The invitation has gone out. We need humility in order to receive the invitation for ourselves. Now this invitation is twofold. Look at verse 17. He says, And at the time for the banquet, he sent, this is the master, sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. There would have been, it's similar to today, there would have been an initial, uh, initial invitation. Okay, kind of like an RSVP. We're throwing a party, you're invited, are you going to come or not? And a lot of people are excited, yeah, I'm, I'll be there. But then the day comes, and another invitation would go out and say, okay, the time is now. The time is now. Everything is prepared. Everything has been done for you. Now is the time to Come. And the parallel is with the initial invitation that had always been given to the Jews. Right? The Jews, they, they were God's people. Throughout, Jesus, throughout the history uh, of, of Israel, the Jews knew that they had this invitation into the kingdom of God. They, they are the ones who had the law. They had the prophets. They are the ones who were anticipating the return of the Meshayach, this Messiah, who was sent by God to deliver his people, they knew they had the initial invitation. And now here comes Jesus. He's the fulfillment of this invitation. Jesus is the one that is saying, the time for the banquet is now. Jesus has come. He's done everything. He's prepared the way. The kingdom of God is at hand. This is what Jesus would say. And the time to respond to the invitation is right now. And so how do they respond? Well, they respond very similarly to the way a lot of people respond. Verse 18 simply says, but they all alike begin to make excuses. You ever been there where like you make plans with somebody and you are amped up about those plans, but then the day for it came and you're like, it was such a long day at work. I'm burnt out. Uh, I got other things going on. I was excited about it two months ago, but today it's the time to do it, and I just, I don't feel like doing it. I don't want to do it. It's kind of the image we see here. That they have better things to do, at least so they think. They got other pressing issues in their life that they got to attend to, and so they can't make time for the invitation. They can't make time for the banquet. And this is the way people approach Christ. They don't have time for Him. They got other things. The busyness of their life does not allow them to receive him. So ultimately they reject him. And I think that this only occurs when we do not understand the significance of the invitation or the eternality of the banquet. So many people just don't get it. They don't get it. They've got better things to do. They are people who take the invitation for granted. Maybe they think, well, there'll be more invitations. This can't be the only invitation. This can't be the only banquet. There's got to be others. And so if I turn this one down, it's, it's no big deal. But I think, who would do that? You think about some, uh, uh, an earthly person, a, a human being that you hold in a place of honor in your mind. 
right? Maybe a, a Lincoln or a Washington or, or somebody who's done incredible things. And imagine them inviting you to come and dine with them. And then you are all excited, but then you say, uh, but I got other things to do. It'd be pretty foolish of us. How much more when we approach the invitation of God to dine with him. That we would dare to say, yeah, you're, you're the creator of all things. I'm breathing now because you give me life. You have mercifully offered me an invitation to dine with you for eternity, but God, I have other things going on. And so we reject it and we turn away from it. How foolish of us. How foolish of us. And so if we do that, this is the master's, this is God's response. Look at the second half of verse 21, and we'll go through the rest. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servants, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you command has been done. And still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. Do you see the heart of God in these passages? If your view of God is that he's this tyrannical being that just can't wait for you to screw up so that he can drop the hammer on you, you have a completely warped and distorted and perverted view of him. His heart is that you would come that you would come. But then he says, for all those who reject it, I tell you, none of these men who were invited, that rejected the invitation, that just had too much going on in their lives, none of them will taste my banquet. This is his response. There will be a shift, a shift in the invitation. A shift from those who think that they deserve an invitation to those who understand that they don't. Those who get it, that they don't even deserve an invitation from the master to dine with him. There will be a shift from the self-exalted to the humble. There will be a shift from those who think that they are strong to those who know that they are weak. A shift from those who think that they are righteous and pure to those who know that they are wretched and in need of cleansing. This will be the shift. Jesus is is calling for the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame You're going from those who think that they deserve an invitation again to those who know that they don't, right? When Jesus is is naming these specific ailments, there was a belief in that day that those ailments were because they were cursed by God because of their sin. So when Jesus is telling the Pharisees, hey, you should have these type of people come in. And then he's saying, you know, these are the type of people that the master is going to invite. It's people that they thought were unclean. They're unclean because of their sin. I can't be associated with people like that. And yet this is exactly who God opens the invitation up to. And praise be to God for that. Because I don't know many of you who are of Jewish descent here. We are Gentiles. We have been grafted in if you have placed your faith in Christ. And now the invitation because of Christ and only because of Christ has been extended to everyone in this room, to all of us. And God sends his invitation to the most undeserving. That's what he's saying. The most undeserving. And it's the undeserving that see the significance of the invitation. I don't think anybody turned it down. I think they stood in awe of the fact that I'm invited to the banquet. I'm invited? Of course I'm going to come. They probably ran to the banquet. Luke 18, 10 through 14, Jesus gives us this same parallel here. 
He, he shows us the difference of the condition of our hearts between those who are self-righteous and think that they are deserving and those who know that they are not that cry out to God. You won't cry out to God if you think that, again, you've got it all together. So in Luke 18, 10 through 14, Jesus gives another example. He says, two men went up into the temple to pray. Two men going up to pray. One is a Pharisee, about as high as you can get on the rung. The other is a tax collector. Uh, that's the low of the low. Man, he's below the rung. You see what he's doing here? The contrast. So one is a Pharisee, one is a tax collector. So now the Pharisee, how does the Pharisee pray to God? This is the religious man. This is the guy who's, again, supposed to be a leader of the people of God, bringing them to God. Well, he stands by himself and he prays thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. If any of you start a prayer like that, just stop. I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, the unjust, the adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. Well, why is he not like other men? Because he has such an in-depth knowledge of God and a deep commitment to God and a deep relationship with God? No, he says, because I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I get. That's what he thinks makes him righteous in the eyes of God. But the tax collector who knows that he is unworthy, he stands far off he would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beats his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone, again, who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. How do you approach God? Do you get who you are in light of this perfect being? This one who is holy and without blemish. It's our understanding of that that will dictate how we approach him. Do we approach him lifting ourselves up in high esteem? Or do we have humility, understanding that we are in such desperate need for God to intervene, for him to intervene on our behalf, because everything that we do is not good enough. And the best that we do will not merit salvation. I don't care how good you think you are or how good you may actually be, because apart from Christ, it's all meaningless. And so the message that Jesus is giving is clear to the audience, and it should be clear to us that there has been an invitation that has gone out. Jesus is the fulfillment of that invitation, and the time to come to him is right now. Yes. It's right now. Yes. So how will you respond to that invitation? Will you do like some, and will you be too busy in your life to respond to Christ? Will you be too wrapped up in maybe even good things in this life, but things that are consuming your time and you have no time for God, you have no time to pursue Him, you have no time to receive the invitation that He extends to you. If you reject the invitation, you reject Jesus. And if you reject Jesus, then you will not dine with God for all, all eternity. This is what He is saying. So for you and I, we have a decision to make. The invitation is extended to you. Christ has done everything. He has done everything. You don't go to the banquet and start setting the table and getting the cups. And He's done everything. He's done everything. And then He invites you and He says, Okay, now that I've done everything, the time for you to come to me is now. I have come. I have lived the life that you are incapable of living. Your sin debt has separated you from God. And if you die in your sin, you'll spend eternity apart from him. But I have come and died in your place. I have paid off your sin debt. 
I have given you my righteousness and I have taken your sin upon myself. Jesus has done it all. He, he was laid his life down. He was crucified. He was buried and he rose again and he offers you and I eternal life with the Father forever and ever, reclining at his table, enjoying his banquet. The invitation from God is extended to you. What will you do with this invitation? We thank you and we praise you for who you are. We are humbled by the reality that you have gone out to the highways and the byways that you desire to bring in all of us who are unworthy and undeserving. And yet this is exactly who you laid your life down for. It is the sick that need a doctor. And God, we recognize that we are sick. We are lost apart from you. I pray, God, that if anybody does not know where they stand with you, if they do not know if they just know about you or if they know you or have intimacy and a relationship with you, God, I pray that you would burden their hearts deeply, that they would have a desire to know you, that they would truly place their trust and their faith in all that you have done for them on the cross of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would save them, that you would place your spirit within them, that you would give them a new heart, that you would give them eyes to see the truth and ears to hear the truth, that they would have a worldview that is drastically changed and that it is a lens that they see everything through the word of God. We thank you, Lord, that you are so gracious and kind to do this for us. So we gather to worship you and to give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.